So after a stock market that dropped at the fastest rate in history, only to turn around and have its best 75 days in history, investors are understandably left wondering, where are we? This week, we lay out a framework to help you get a better idea of where you need to be. So where are we? We're going to talk about it in two main respects this week. Number one, where are the markets, and we'll use the U.S. stock market because I know that's what most uh, of you care about or at least focused on or reading about in the newspapers. And then where are we? Where are we as investors? I'll caution up front. We should have more of a focus than the S&P 500. Most of your portfolios, certainly for those of your clients, should be in things more than just the S&P 500. I know it's, I always hesitate to try to share this data because again, I don't want to put it out there with the idea that you need to do something with it or try to predict where markets are going. We're not in the prediction business, we're in the process business. That being said, what is going on? Well, for the S&P 500, we're almost back to where we started the year, uh, which is just unbelievable when we think about how low things got in March. Buoyed this, uh, this week and really today by a jobs report that caught everybody off guard. Uh, the addition of 2.5 or 2.8 million jobs when losses of about 8 million were expected. And the bull thesis says uh, it's gonna be a V-shaped recovery, economic recovery is ahead of schedule. Uh, it's possible. I would tell you what I believe to be more probable is that all the PPP loans that were being issued in April and therefore all the employers that took those that were having to bring those people back onto the payrolls then in late April, early May was more likely reflected in this. Uh, that conviction is further buoyed by the fact that the number one component of the increase in jobs was in restaurants, followed up by dental offices and laundry services. Three things that for the most part were shut down or certainly at a heavily impaired level those first two weeks of May. So a little skeptical about that data. Uh, even if there's some positivity to that for the moment and businesses who are trying to, again, give it a go, and we certainly wish them all the best. We're rooting, of course, uh, for America. Keep in mind, we still got 40 million people unemployed. We still have travel plans in the major metropolitan areas that are 90% below uh, where they were previously. We have wages that have been wiped out to a greater extent than they were in the 2008 crisis. So for those of you who are tempted by uh, jumping on the Hertz bandwagon, I saw that stock was up big this week on bankruptcy news. Um, for those people who are really tempted by airline stocks, uh, while many of those are gonna get bailed out, again, look at some of that underlying data. There's a lot of reasons to, again, be pretty skeptical and cautious. Uh, here's the last one I'll leave you with. Insider trading, the legal kind. Uh, companies right now on whole are not buying back their shares. They've been doing that in record numbers for a number of years. On the contrary, share issuance has gone up, which is telling you they would rather not buy back your share. They would rather sell you a new share. Of course, that dilutes existing shareholders, but it also tells you a lot about uh, their belief in where maybe the next six to 12 months are. Markets do look forward. But when earnings and GDP, even the optimistic estimates, have the markets uh, looking forward to 2023 earnings, I'd say we've gone be beyond optimism to something more like that irrational exuberance that people have talked about. Markets are forward-looking. They're not that forward-looking. So all that's to say, uh, we're grateful for the market's uh, rebound because uh, we know how much that helps uh, all of you and help you sleep at night. But again, get mentally prepared for the idea that there could be more volatility. Uh, there's a path through it. That's what we're going to touch on next. Uh, but I, I, don't, I think it's a little too early to signal the all clear. So with that, let's get to where are you? Um, I'm going to use this analogy for this. Uh, so many investors in their proverbial boats drifting in the ocean, uh, wondering how they can predict the weather. Uh, where are markets headed next? Should I be in this stock or that? This asset class or that asset class? As opposed to focusing on their own journey. What is your destination? What is the course then that needs to be charted to help you have the greatest chances of successfully getting there? I think most of us can agree, if we were in a boat drifting in the middle of the ocean, the best usage of our time would not be predicting weather. It would be figuring out where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. And then I can tell you, so many investors, again, in, to use that analogy, are spending their time trying to predict the weather. It's useless for two reasons. Number one, you can't predict the weather. Number two, 
Uh, it's not necessary to get where you're going to go. People for centuries traversed the oceans with no ability to predict the weather, but they knew how to get through whatever was going to come. And as I've said to you before, that's where we're uh, hoping you'll invite us into that boat, help you captain that ship. Um, we're not in the predicting weather business, but we do know how to help get you through whatever is going to come. And that's where I would have you use this energy that you have as most investors are getting whipped around between the fear of loss and the fear of missing out, channel all that into asking, what is your story? Where are you trying to drive? Now with risk off the table for the moment, is now a time to readdress the types of risk discussions and questions you had in your own mind during the market lows of March, as Jake touched on last week. For us, we see, the reason we harp on this is we see time and time again, and we get the feedback from clients that those people who have put the time in on truly assessing their risk and volatility tolerance is really the best way to put it and charted their own plan and been able to anchor on that and look back to it, whether it's the temptation of selling out at a bottom or chasing at a top, have greater clarity, they've got greater confidence and we are able to have with them much more constructive conversations that focus solely on how we help them achieve their financial goals than people who haven't done it. Now, I know for many of you who are clients, uh, you've gone through this. Maybe you've gone through a part of it, or maybe we need to go back and readdress it. But here again, maybe you've got a lot of f family, friends, coworkers that you, you see the angst in them of constantly moving between these twin fears of, of loss and uh, lost opportunity when they could just be focusing on their plan. We want to get people uh, to that better place. So in closing, uh, the future can't be known, but your financial future can be. So let's put our time and our energy to focus to doing that. Peaks feel good. So again, some people have been getting some texts say, oh, you must feel so good. Nah, good markets unnerve me <laughs> uh, because peaks feel good, valleys feel bad. But what I've known, uh, what I've come to know after 20 years of doing this is uh, my feelings are really irrelevant uh, to being good at my job and to helping other people. And I hope you can come to that same place of understanding the need to check those feelings, embrace that process. Again, for those of you who are taking this journey uh, with us, thank you so much. Uh, and we look forward to talking with you soon. <laughs>